Since the dawn of civilization in ancient Mesopotamia, possession by malevolent forces has been an explanation for physical and mental illness, the topic of extensive religious and philosophical speculation, and an overall source of existential dread. After all, what could be more horrifying than to become infested with a creature hostile to your very existence? While demonic and jinn possession are the dominant tropes in Abrahamic theories of possession and exorcism, the rise of the Kabbalah within Judaism would signal the appearance of a new threat, possession by the malevolent spirits of the dead. While rejected in both Orthodox Christianity and Islam, possession by the evil dead, or a ruach ra'ah, literally a evil spirit, now commonly more referred to as a dibek, came to be the dominant form of possession in Judaism. But to understand this shift in theory of possession and the practice of exorcism, we must dive into a radically new concept introduced into Spanish Kabbalah, Gilgul, or reincarnation. Again, a concept embraced in Kabbalah, but rejected by both Orthodox Christianity and Islam. From the rise of Kabbalah, its theory of polypsychism, Gilgul and reincarnation, and Ibur, or spiritual impregnation, will emerge a wholly new theory of possession and exorcism. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, Make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics of esotericism, including curated playlists. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics of esotericism here on YouTube, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon with a one-time donation, or you can use the cool little super thanks option below the video. This episode is also really exciting because it's part of a spooky multi-part collaboration with Philip over at Let's Talk Religion, Angela from Angela's Symposium, and Dana Trail from The Modern Hermeticist. All of us are going to be touching on the interaction between the world of the spirits and our own world. So make sure to check out all those wonderful episodes. They're amazing channels, and make sure to subscribe to all of them for fantastic content. But now, let's turn to the emergence from the Kabbalah of Dybbuk Possession into supernatural history. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. The history of spirit possession in Israelite religion and Judaism stretches back nearly three millennia. In fact, I've done a two-part broad overview of that topic if you want to check it out in the episodes above. But in this episode, I want to dive a bit deeper into a crucial moment in which a purely Kabbalistic theory of possession and exorcism emerged. Like virtually all religions of the time, the Judaism of the Second Temple period accepted a theory in which non-human malevolent spirits that we sometimes often now call demons could invade the human body and had to be repulsed through a wide range of amulets, incantation, and physical treatments including fumigations, including sulfurous fumigations. In fact, Jews and Judaism were famous in the ancient Roman world as exorcists. And one of the most famous of those exorcists, had he not had a second career as a messiah, was the Galilean Jesus of Nazareth, of which the majority of his miracles were in fact exorcisms. However, as Christianity emerged and gained hegemony, religious hegemony in the ancient world, rabbinical Judaism increasingly lost interest in the topic of possession and exorcism. This is probably precisely because of how Christianity embraced that very practice and thus Jewish efforts to distance itself from what it took to be basically a heretical spin-off 
Thus, possession and exorcism narratives increasingly go silent in the Jewish world of late antiquity, with only a few fragments of such text appearing in the famed Cairo Geniza, and those look much more like kind of the generic Greek magical papyri style exorcisms. And so it remained for nearly a thousand years, as if possession and exorcism had simply vanished from Judaism. Of course, speculation about demonic beings, Ruchot, Shedim, Mazakin, and others continued, especially in the circles of the Chasti Ashkenaz, but no truly systematic demonology, much less narratives of how those demons possess people, really ever emerged much in this period. Of course, trapping demons in incantation bowls, sure, but possession and exorcism? Not so much. However, as early as the 8th century Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, a subtle shift in Jewish demonological etiology appeared. This text argued that at least some demonic beings, at least some of them, were actually the transformed souls of all those that had died in the Great Flood, like Noah's Flood. Their souls were so filled with Hamas, or violence, that they had become transformed into roving demonic creatures. This is a marked difference with the earlier, very ancient Enochic speculation about demons, that those creatures were originally angels who had descended from the heavens to mate with human women, or the offspring of such matings, these are the Nephilim that you may know. And the later rabbinic speculation found in things like the Talmud that these were spirits created on the eve of the first Shabbat, for which no accompanying bodies were created, thus inspiring their rage at mankind. They wanted clay dungeons too. Also increasingly through this period, for instance, in the thought of the most important biblical commentator Rashi, we see a tendency of writers to conflate terms for the various demonic beings into a somewhat internally similar species. Thus, Ruchot, Shedim, Sa'arim, Mazakin, etc simply become different words for very similar, sometimes even the same kinds of beings with slight modifications. Of course, while demonic and jinn possession were the orthodox position in Christian and Muslim circles, despite the dearth of such narratives at this point in Jewish history, none of the Abrahamic religions thought that the spirits of the dead could come to inhabit the living, at least not officially. In fact, Islam held that all spirits of the dead dwelled in the barzakh, barring the door to even hauntings by ghosts or things like that, that really aren't even ghosts in Islam. Folk Christianity, however, did incorporate elements from indigenous pagan religions and tolerated more of the possibility of the disembodied dead both haunting places and possessing people. In fact, the survival of ideas like the thinning of the veil around Halloween, Sawan, and Celtic Christianity reflects these more or less unofficial conceptions vis-a-vis -vis the continued presence of the dead among the living. While Judaism did have a sense that the spirits of the dead, at least in theory, like the generation of the flood mentioned back there in Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, could be transformed into malevolent beings like demons, that they could possess the living would require a much, much more elaborate theoretical foundation. And Judaism would develop just that line of thinking in the Kabbalah. The development of possession by the spirits of the malevolent dead, what we now call Dibbic possession, developed over the course of a few centuries. The first major developments are actually simultaneous with the emergence of the Kabbalah itself. The first true text of the Kabbalah, as you probably know, is the Sefer Bahir, or the Book of Illumination, and I have an entire episode dedicated to just that if you want to check it out in a deeper dive in the card above. Now, the Sefer Bahir is notoriously convoluted. The joke, of course, is that after it was composed, the author just threw the pages into the air, and wherever they fell on the ground is how they got edited together. That's just how of a mess the Sefer Bahir is. Now, despite this, many of the f major elements of the future Kabbalah as we know it actually come for the first time 
in this text, most famously the Sfirot as divine emanations. The Sfirot appear earlier, but never really as divine emanations until the Sefer Bahir. This text also contains the first oblique reference to another key concept in Kabbalah, the transmigration of souls or reincarnation, what will later become known as Gilgul. Ironically enough, the concept is actually introduced in a reference to the book of Ecclesiastes, a text notorious precisely because of its skepticism about the survival of the human soul after death. One gets the sense that the author of the Safer by Here has a cheeky sense of humor, introducing and proof texting the concept of reincarnation using a text that at least apparently denies any such spiritual survival. The Ramban, by the way, will keep that joke up in his commentary on Ecclesiastes vis-a-vis -vis Gilgul or reincarnation as well. Now, admittedly, we know very little about the theory of reincarnation or Gilgul at its earliest period of development in the Kabbalah. It seems hinted at in the emerging Spanish schools of the time, but it must have been a profoundly esoteric secret even among those small, early schools of Kabbalah. Further, the introduction of such a radical idea, one basically otherwise utterly unknown, even to this day in most Orthodox Abrahamic religions, could have actually earned the ire of the very Christians that, for instance, the Kabbalist Nachmanides, or the Ramban that I just mentioned ago, found himself often having to be forced into debates with, often for just the privilege of Jewish communities to remain in their Iberian homelands. A privilege, of course, whose doom history had yet wrought. However, it appears that Nachmanides also hinted at a distinction in the overall theory of reincarnation, or Gilgul, as I just mentioned it a moment ago. For him, and later Kabbalists of the late 13th century, the period just around the end of the development of the Sefer Zohar, the most central text of the Kabbalah itself. It appears that Gilgul at this time was the technical term for the reincarnation of the soul at birth, or at least one aspect of one's soul by a previous incarnated soul. However, Kabbalists of a slightly later period would introduce the concept of Ibor, or impregnation, in which a previously incarnated soul or soul aspect could come to be temporarily hosted by a living person. This is like temporary Gilgul. Thus, Gilgul was the overall moment of reincarnation at birth or conception, while Ibor were the micro incarnations that came and went throughout one's lifetime. However, this requires another key element also under development during the rise of the early Kabbalah, polypsychism, the belief that the soul has several parts or that one person can have several distinct souls. It kind of kind of comes out the same on the wash. By the 13th century and even a little before, the general attitude of the Abrahamic religions was that the soul was a single undifferentiated unity. Unlike, for instance, Plato, who actually held that this soul had three mariological aspects, reason, spirit, and appetite, that the task of people were to control them like a person controls a chariot. Thus, if the soul were an undifferentiated unity, any theory of transmigration would be wholesale, a theory a bit more like that of Pythagoras, where Plato got it from, or certain schools of Hinduism, perhaps. The Zohar, for its part, also introduced a three-layered theory of the soul, the Ruach, the Nefesh, and the Neshama. Further, and key to our discussion, these soul layers are discrete and can apparently contain spiritual data from heterogeneous spiritual origins. Thus, Kabbalistic polypsychism means that one soul could contain spiritual data from any combination of the three souls of previous people, and individual spiritual layers could be temporarily exchanged through the process of ibor, or spiritual impregnation. For some reason, this idea always brought to mind like, like old school slot machines. Soul. Mm. Regardless, at this point, the major theoretical architecture for the Dybbuk was basically in place. The transformation of especially bad sinners into malevolent, if not 
straightforwardly demonic beings, the notion of spiritual migration and the development of Ebor and polypsychism, which would allow for temporary spiritual inhabitation or just possession. However, the earliest Kabbalists seem to preserve the process of Ebor for the temporary inhabitation of especially righteous souls into other righteous souls, often in the process of achieving a kind of spiritual reparation or tikkun for either a spiritual failure from a previous life. The Zohar is mostly concerned with fixing sexual sins, which give rise to demons, or dying childless, which the Zohar thinks is especially horrifying or to aid a living person to accomplish a spiritual task that they otherwise haven't, wouldn't have the spiritual potency, the chizuk, to achieve. This process of becoming spiritually inhabited by the righteous dead would most often be achieved through a process called yichudim, or hichtatchut, where one literally lies on the grave of the person one wishes to become spiritually impregnated with, their ruach becomes part of your ruach, or is exchanged for your ruach. This process of necromantic incubation would go on to shocking popularity in Lurianic circles in the 16th century around the city of Sfat or Safed, a city literally, literally surrounded by the righteous dead. However, it would be Moshe Cordovero, that great systematizer of Kabbalah, that would introduce the concept of negative ipur, or spiritual impregnation, and thus pave the way for our understanding of dibic possession. In fact, just in time, just in time, given that the first such dibic possession would occur one year after Moshe Cordovero's death and be witnessed by his own teacher, Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz, in 1571, just a few years before his own death in 1576. However, again, the movement to Dybbuk possession was a theoretically slow one. Cordovero holds that negative Ibor is possible actually in an extraordinary commentary on the cycle of the morning blessings that one recites every morning of all things. These blessings recited every morning, as I mentioned, express gratitude for not being born a woman, not being born a Gentile, and not being born a slave. Now, clear appreciation of the misogynistic, classist, and bigoted nature of these blessings aside, they're still expressive of the late classical world in which they were developed. You wouldn't want to be a slave or a woman or a non-Jewish person in a Jewish community at the time these blessings were developed. However, Cordovero is interested in a curious fact about these blessings. Why say them every day if the Gilgul that gave one a male Jewish free soul had already been accomplished at the time of conception or birth or somewhere along the way. His answer is that these three blessings are recited first thing in the morning because such a negative ebor could have happened during the night. How? Recall that the Talmud conceives of sleep as one sixtieth of death. This fractional death during sleep is enough, apparently, that the spirit of a Gentile, a woman, or a slave could come to impregnate one's soul in the spiritually liminal region between life and death, even this relatively tiny death through the night. However, Cordovero sees this more of an explanation for what he takes to be negative psychological factors in a person, the development of a slavish mentality or the lack of a desire on the part of a Jewish person to perform Jewish legal requirements, for instance, as an evidence of this negative ebor. This is kind of an extension of ideas from the Zohar, where one psychological aspects, even what the Zohar takes to be something like mental illness, can be explained in the process of Gilgul more generally. You have kind of a inner conflict, a schizoid soul at some level. Here made to explain also negative features through the negative micro-incarnations of Ibor. It even seems that the recitation of those blessings esoterically understood at least, has the effect of ejecting such an ibor or iburim, thus preventing them from becoming grafted or harkava onto one's soul in a more permanent fashion. But note what's missing here. These are relatively small incarnations, one sixtieth of one aspect of one's soul, which only influence psychological traits in an ongoing, even daily process of possession, 
at night, and then auto-exorcism through prayer in the morning. This is not, not the form of possession in which the entire psychology of a person is commandeered by the malevolent spirits of the dead, what we now think of as dibic possession. But just as Ibor began as the impregnation of the soul of a righteous person by the righteous dead, so too would the more wholesale psychological possession start with righteous possession, specifically in the form of temporary possession by the Magid, or a kind of quasi-angelic teacher that comes to possess a person. This form of possession seems to have begun in the Kabbalistic circles of probably the most important modern Jewish legalist and the author of the definitive book of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch, the prepared table, Joseph Caro and his colleague Shlomo Alkabetz that I just mentioned, who will come back to be important here in just a minute, over in Salonika and what is now Greece. There, a quasi-angelic spirit form of the legal text, the Mishnah, yep, Angel Mishnah, comes to both teach but also possess Joseph Caro such that the voice of the Magid would issue forth from Caro in what was probably something like a trance state. In fact, it was at the urging of this Magid that both Caro and Alcabets and others moved from Salonika to Safed in the Galilee, thus greatly accelerating the region as the Kabbalistic ground zero that it remains to this day. Though this type of possession differs from Ibor in Dybbuk possession in that the Magid is an angel-like being, not the spirit of a dead person. Yet what it shares with later Dybbuk possession is both the full, if temporary, psychological possession of the person, along with the trait that both the Magid and the Dybbuk, for very different reasons, seem to express themselves primarily through the speech of the possessed person. And yet, at the same time the Magid was speaking through Yosef Caro, the first quasi dybbuk like cases were also emerging back in Iberia, the heartland of the Kabbalah. In these early cases, a young Christian girl, a young Christian girl comes to be inhabited by the spirit of a failed messianic Kabbalist, who also sinfully used divine names for personal rather than redemptive ends. Don't do that. In another tale, the spirit of a dead woman temporarily returned to her own body, her own body, causing her to sit up and through a kind of dreadful spiritual ventriloquism, somehow reveal secrets of the future despite remaining mute. Maybe this is like telepathy or something. Now, both of these tales actually emerge from a single book, Yehuda Kaleva's Safna Pa'aneach, of, or The Exposer of the Mysteries, a text actually unsurprisingly meant to use such scary tales to basically scare people into belief in the supernatural and thus into the necessity of scrupulous attention and devotion to Jewish law to avoid brushes with the evil dead or eventually divine judgment. So one can wonder about exactly the veracity of these tales, considering that they're basically there to scare people into being pious. However, the community of Tzfat or Safed would not need tall tales from Iberia to frighten them much longer. What we now call the Dybbuk would soon arrive among them. With all these major elements intact, the first major and well-known case of Dybbuk possession, known as the Falcon case after Rabbi Elijah Falcon, who actually published this as the great event in Safed, this Dybbuk case began on the 16th of February, 1571. In this case, a unnamed young woman becomes possessed by the spirit of a certain Samuel Tzfati, who himself was either her brother-in-law or uncle by marriage, it's not clear, who had died over in Tripoli after leading a rather profligate and heretical life. He believed that all religions were the same, God forbid. Further, there's also a strong sexual element here as well, like in most possession cases. The act of possession is thought to have been synonymous with copulation, and even the caddish spirit of Samuel justifies himself by noting that her husband's actually off at Salonika anyhow. One wonders if this sexual relationship predated the death of Samuel as well. The exorcist, by the way, go on to check the story by speaking to the young woman in languages known to Samuel, 
but unknown to her, which apparently she could, she could reproduce. She could speak languages that she didn't know. At this point, they begin the exorcism by using burning sulfur, a thing we all know going all the way back to the Greek magical pyre, if not before. And eventually, after much cajoling, the spirit is said to have exited via her vagina, again, after considerable negotiations. The sexual element here remains very, very strong. Sadly, only eight days later, the spirit of Samuel returns and is said to have choked the woman to death. In fact, the repossession and subsequent death of the possessed in these early Dybbuk narratives is actually more the rule than the exception. And not only does the great event of Safed go on to become published as a broadsheet and circulated widely through Europe, but one of the premier Kabbalistic elders of the day, Shlomo Alkabetz, already mentioned a couple of times here, the teacher of Moses Cordovero, the composer of the classic Kabbalat Shabbat song, Lecha Dodi, personally affixes his name to the text as testimony to its truth. The Falcon Dybbuk case would go on to be the spark to light the prairie fire, and suddenly Kabbalists found themselves pitted against case after case of those possessed with the evil dead. In the last year of his life, the Kabbalistic genius Isaac Luria would go on to train his student Chaim Vital, the progenitor of Kabbalah as we know it today, to become the chief theoretician and exorcist of this mounting Dybbuk plague. It would be Vital that would argue that these evil spirits were such sinners in their past lives that they failed to warrant even Gehenna, a place of spiritual purification through post-mortem torture, though it couldn't extend more than a year, and you even got Shabbat off there in Gehenna. Thus, these especially sinful people were to be tortured, barring some higher rectification or tikkun by being forced to roam the world in agony, seeking respite from this condition by binding themselves to the living. In Hebrew, the word that Vital uses for that binding is mit dabkim, and you can probably hear in the shoresh, or the root of that word, the one that does the binding is a dibbuk, and thus the dabak, the clinger, the binder, has finally come into being. The result of a dozen highly specialized Kabbalistic conceptions taking centuries to mature, though once unleashed, the Dybbuk will go on to haunt the Jewish world with contemporary cases actually growing in the ultra-Orthodox or Haredi world. The Kabbalah has given us the Dybbuk, but it hasn't really vanquished the Dybbuk. If you're interested in the history of demons and spirits, occult magic, or Kabbalah, again, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica. These are all core aspects of our channel, and you want to make sure to check out our other content, and again, other folks working on this collaboration. It's really fascinating stuff we're all working on. And again, if you value freely accessible and scholarly approaches to this kind of material, I hope you consider supporting my work via Patreon, a one-time donation, or with the Super Thanks option. Again, I really do appreciate your support. Thank you. Goldish's Spirit Possession in Judaism is an excellent resource for a wide range of articles with a great appendix of primary sources and literally some of the oldest accounts of Dybbuk's and the primary sources we have. Lawrence Fine's article, by the way, on Benevolent Spirit Possession, or Ebor, is really, really a great article and well worth reading. Shay's Between Worlds is probably the most comprehensive study of Kabbalah and Dybbuk's in the early Safed period and beyond. And if you're interested in the intersection of Lurianic Kabbalah and Dybbuk's, this is by far the best work, and I'll be coming back to specific Lurianic stuff on Dybbuk's later at some future time. There's a text by Winkler, this is called The Dybbuk. It's a non-academic text written from an Orthodox Jewish perspective and also provides several different Dybbuk accounts all the way up until the Hasidic period. This is interesting because it's a traditional Jewish perspective on the issue, but it's not an academic text, so your mileage may vary. Also, finally, if you haven't read Ansky's play The Dybbuk or seen the 1937 film, you're missing out. It's one of the most amazingly spooky films and a great play. You can also get a really cheap English Yiddish edition if you read German and Hebrew letters and you can kind of make most of it out. The film is a 
the positively lovely and spooky testament to the lost world of both modernity and the horrors of fascism, as nearly everyone who worked on that film was murdered in subsequent years by the fascists. May their blood be avenged. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.